Hello, this is Mike Lively, and today we're in Chapter 2 of Paper Vision. And last time we had created an undulating sphere. And here's that undulating sphere, and we went through quite a bit of code in order to do that. Let me show you that in the book. So here we are in the book, and if you just kind of page down through here, wow, that's a lot of code to make that happen. And as I said, there's got to be a way to encapsulate this to make this whole process easier. Of course, through this entire series, our goal is actually to create classes that generate classes. So uh, we'll be actually looking for ways to make this easier. Now, Paper Vision has created a way to make this easier, and it's through something called Basic View. So let me run the Basic View example we're going to be talking about today. So that example is Cube Example. I'm going to actually put all this on my blog so you guys can download this code. And let's go ahead and run it. And in this cube example, I have an oscillating cube. And when you click on it, it pauses and it changes material. Now, a lot of people think it's very difficult to change materials on cube. It's not. It's all set up in paper vision. I'm going to show you how to do that today. But click on it again, and your cube begins to spin. Click on it, it pauses. And as it pauses, it changes materials. So it's a nice little uh, example to show you. Get some interactivity going. Because you see your hand rolls away. If you have an arrow rolls over, you get that hand showing you that this cube is interactive. And click on it, and then something happens. So nice example. We'll be going through this example in detail today. But what does it use? Basic view. And what does basic view do for us? It encapsulates all this code. So as I said, we've got this huge amount of code we wrote for the last example. And all these functions and methods, could that be done easier? Yes, we can encapsulate it. We can get them out of the way so we don't have to see them and create a mechanism that in a sense is user friendly that creates all this code for us automatically. And that is basic view. So if you take a look at the cube example, at the very top of it, you import the basic view class right here. And then you just extend your cube example class. And so when you extend the cube example class, what's that do what that does, it takes all that encapsulated basic view code and brings it right into your cube uh, main file as if it was all written in there. So now you can use all those classes, all those methods that are kept in the back end. So how do we find out what's in basic view? Really easy, just roll over basic view and click on it, and that'll take you to the basic view class. And if you go to the top of this, you see it imports all that stuff that we had to import earlier. You got your 3D camera, you got your uh, scene, you got your 3D objects, you've got your render engine, all being brought in uh, through uh, the basic view class. Let's scroll down. And so I don't have to declare a scene in my other uh, project because it's declared here. And so when I extend any class with basic view, I automatically get all the paper vision stuff. Now, if you take a look at the basic view class, you can see you can put in the viewport width, the viewport height. You have a scale to stage. You have the Boolean if it's interactive or not. But one more thing, which is very interesting, let me scale all the way over here, is you have a camera type. So no longer do you have to put in the camera type. You can choose from a list using a switch case. So if you go below here, you see this nice little switch case that allows you to choose several cameras. You can have a debug camera, a target camera, a spring camera, or a free camera. Now the Spring camera is wonderful. I talk about that later in the book. I do a little racing game. And in that, I show that as you turn a corner with a car, you don't want the camera to stay with that. You want to kind of swerve as if there's some centrifugal force. And the spring camera has a physics in that to do it. So we'll go through that in detail later on in a further video. But for now, I just want to show you you have those choices. And uh, let's go back to our example and see if we can understand it. So we're back in the cube example, and as opposed to bringing in all of that camera stuff, all that scene stuff, all that viewport stuff, we just use basic view. We can now initiate our example and start running it. But what is the backbone of what's happening here is at the very bottom, we have this method called onRenderTick. And what the heck is that? Well, let's go back and take a look at that. And how do I find onRenderTick? Well, see, look, here's my onRenderTick here, but it's part of the super class. What is the super class? That's my basic view class. So if I roll over super, it'll take me right to basic view. Now if I look for on render tick here, I'm not going to find it. But look, basic view is, ex is extended by abstract view. Let's go to abstract view. Once again, all these layers of encapsulation makes it a little bit complicated to understand basic view. But if you just use your control roll over click, you can go to the class that extends. And now let's look for on render tick. I'm going to control F. I got on render tick in there. Let's go find. And there it is right there. And there it is right there. And what is on render tick doing? It is sewing together my seam, my camera, and my viewport. We talked about that last time in the previous video. So we know that that does. But you know what? That's not enough to make a scene happen. And this is a protected function. So what do I need to do? I need to override that protection in my main class and put inside that loop all the stuff that I need to make my paper vision project run correctly. 
Let's go back now to our cube example and see how that works. So if I go to my cube example, I'm in my uh, on render tick, and what I want to do is override that because it's a protected function. So let's override that protected function. And within that, in addition to the uh, render of the viewport, the camera, and the scene, I'm going to add this additional code. Let's rotate our cube. Now I do a little bit more, and what I'm saying is when the cube's been clicked on, if the modulo of the number of clicks is not equal to one, then rotate. If it is, then don't rotate. Sounds a little complicated, but we'll go through the entire code so you can understand all this in detail. Now that we've encapsulated all that paper vision junk in the back end, the code becomes very much more transparent. Let's go through it step by step. So the first thing I do is I have my import statements, and I definitely need what? That basic view. I also have a material list. We're going to talk about that today. I'm going to do some interactivity. I need that. And also my materials, as far as what I'm going to put on the sides of my cube, are the color materials. So we're going to talk about that as well. So just, you know, four or five things that I need here. I have my metadata tag. So I'm going to basically set my uh, SWF to 800 by 600 with a background of uh, black and frame rate of 60. Then once again, my main class has been declared, and I'm using basic view. Excellent. And I need a cube, so I just declare a cube. That's just a, a primitive that I'm going to bring in. And notice that I'm bringing the cube in from the primitives folder. And then I need materials. So I have a materials list. This is a wonderful mechanism. And what, basically what it is is a dictionary. It allows me to associate names with quantities. Okay. And then I'm going to declare my color materials. So I'm going to call this C red, C green, C blue, which basically is the complement colors of red, green, and blue. And I actually am putting the hexadecimal into those uh, complement colors as I declare them. So this is a mechanism that's used over and over again when you have a class that you want to declare it. First, you have to go private var and give it a name. Then you uh, tell me where it's going to come from, from its class. And then you declare the new class. And this particular class takes the color. Now, how do I know that? I roll over that with my control, and I go to that color class, and then I examine how it's built. Why do I want to examine how it's built? Because you know what, folks? We're going to learn to hack paper vision. In order to do that, you have to look at these classes and figure out how they're made. Here's the inputs right here. Here's my color. But I can also put an alpha in there, and I can set my interactivity to true or false. So it's very important that you start looking at these classes and how they're built. It will save you tons of time when programming paper vision. You don't have to run to a book. Just run to the class. So we're back in our cube example. We've declared our materials, so we can use those where we need them. Now a little bit lower, I'm going to do something very interesting. This is the heart of my program. I'm going to declare a my click is number. And pretty much every time I click on my cube, it's going to tell me how many times I've clicked. Now why is that important? Because there's actually four states to my cube. I click, it stops. And the color changes. I click, it goes. I click again, and it stops. And I click, it goes. So there's four states because I'm changing two sets of colors and I'm having two stop and go states. And combine those two times two is four. Okay, and now I have my what? My constructor function, so whenever I instantiate the program, it runs. And what am I doing? I'm using this super class. That's right. I'm going to, the first, and what does that mean? I don't know. So let's just click on that, roll over and click on it and see what those parameters mean. Well, the first is the viewport. Whoa, the second is the viewport width and height. But wasn't that zero, zero? How can I get away with that? Because I set my scale to stage to true. And when I set scale to stage to true, that means it's going to ignore those first two values, 0, 0, and just scale it to the whole stage. So that's what happens there. And then finally, I have some interactivity. I want that to be true. Now, once again, it's all easy. I'm just going to initiate paper vision. I'm going to create some listeners. And I'm going to start rendering. So let's go through these methods step by step. Let's look at initiate PV3D. Let's click on that. Control click. There I am right there. I'm going to set my button view mode to true. Now what that does, it gives me the hand when I roll over the cube. So I roll over and it is set to the hand as opposed to a cursor. That's a visual cue that that cube is interactive. Then I have to set the materials to interactive. If I don't set my materials to interactive, it won't be interactive. And now I'm going to create a materials list. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my colors inside of that cube. Now I'm going to make something very, very important here. While the material list can be used for anything, and you can extend it for other objects, and you will, these names front, back, left, right, top, bottom, are specific to the paper vision cube. If you try to call this name something else, like front two or front end or whatever, it will not work. Okay? 
So this is specific to the paper vision cube. So once that materials list is created, it's stuck into the cube parameter. And then you're going to set the cube sides, 400 by 400 by 400. And then you're going to add your cube to the scene, and it's ready to rock and roll. So I see that I'm running out of time. So next time, we'll talk about the materials list.